Hi, today we're going to start a new section on beams. So we have a number of objectives in chapter 6 dealing with beams. Today we're going to look at some of the fundamental skills we need to know. Um, so if we're going to learn about beams, I guess we need to understand what is a beam. So we have a few things on this diagram. Um, maybe we might consider them to be beams. Well, beams have a very specific definition. So um, first of all, they are in equilibrium. So they have a balance, uh, and we'll talk about that, of course, in moments. Uh, they support loads only in one direction, and that direction is typically up and down, although we can consider things to be beams that are not just up and down forces. Um, however, for most of our questions, we're going to see up and down forces. Um, and then also, when we do calculations, we also consider that the beam is strong and so strong that the loads are much more substantial than the weight of the beam. So we consider the beam to be weightless. Um, and so if I was to consider with all of those things, what would be a beam in this, um, this uh, picture? What we have is horizontal beams, um, pretty much most of the spaces where we have those workers standing uh, would be considered to be beams, so loads going straight up and down. So we use the term equilibrium, and as well when I use the term equilibrium, what I said was balance. And so we can think of equilibrium as a way we can measure balance. So if we have the same loads that are existing on each side of some object, hopefully it should be in balance. Okay, And so if we have all of the external loads that are equalized or balancing each other, then we have a system that's in equilibrium. Doesn't always have to be the case. So if you have an object that's in motion, if the force is balanced, the object will stay in motion. That's our, our some of our laws of motion. Um, however, when we talk about beams, usually we want them to be stationary. So we consider that an object would be in equilibrium if it is not moving and not starting to move. There's two approaches that you see if you start looking at beam calculations. We have what's known as the vector form of equilibrium. So the vector form of equilibrium uh, is using vectors. And you can see I have it represented as some bold letters in my equations. And the bold letters mean vectors. And so we know that a vector has both magnitude and direction. And so when we have vectors, we have a way that we account for them. And we say all of the vector quantities have to add up to zero. And you can see my little symbol that I've used there. is a sigma, so that's a Greek character. And what it means is sum, uh, not sum, S-O-M-E, like we get to pick and choose which ones we want to use, but sum as in all of them. So we're going to use that as a means to add them all up. So if we were to add up all of the forces acting on a point, they would equal zero or be in equilibrium. Okay, so that would be one form of this equation. And what's really important about using a vector form would be the signs. So if we're using a vector form of our equation, what we would want to make sure is that we account for things in the right way and assign them correct signs. So if we have something that's moving upwards, a force for instance, we would consider that to be a positive force. Um, if we have a moment, so a rotation, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and if it's in the clockwise direction, we'd consider it to be positive. Now, if we had the opposite, we had downs and counterclockwise, then we would use negative values for those. And so we would add up all the positives and the negative values, and we would hope that we would get zero at the end, which would tell us we were in equilibrium. This form is a little more complicated because then we have to assign sign conventions, and I find that it's a little easier to deal with calculating beams and using these equations if we use what's known as the scalar form of the equilibrium. Okay, 
And in this case, instead of seeing all of the vectors going up have to equal everything coming down, what we just say is everything's a positive value and we're going to use their signs or the symbols attached to them to decide which direction they're in. And when we do that, what we're going to say is all of the forces that are going up have to balance all of the forces that are going down. As well, all of the moments that are rotating in a clockwise direction are going to have to balance all of the moments that are rotating in the counterclockwise direction. So we're going to use this approach, or I'd advise you to use this approach, in differentiating between positive and negative values. Um, we're just going to look at the signs. So up has to equal down, clockwise has to equal counterclockwise. And if both of those things come true, then we know we're going to be in equilibrium. Um, I'd mentioned a moment before, so we use forces when we talk about beams, but we also use moments, okay? And moments could be considered to be somewhat similar to a torque. Uh, it's a measurement of a force applied at a perpendicular distance. So what it tends to do is create a rotation. So if we have a moment, uh, the greater the force, the greater the moment. Okay. But also, the furthest ex further extended it is from a pivot point, the more effective that force is going to be at trying to rotate something. So, for instance, if I had uh, a measurement of a moment, it's going to be a force multiplied by a perpendicular distance. Okay. Um, units for a moment is going to be in newton meters, as I have a newton times a meter would be my standard units. So I have a um, section of beam here and I want to calculate the moment. So uh, it's three meters long and there's a three kilonewton force that is pushing down. Okay. So first thing that we're going to do is assign some reference point. So where do I want to take the moment from? Uh, and assuming it's from that, that end. I also want to confirm that that force is acting in a perpendicular di direction. And in this case, it is. So it's going straight down, which is perpendicular to the distance, the three meters. So my moment at A, so I've used that subscript A to designate where I'm taking my moment about. The moment at A is going to be equal to three kilonewtons times three meters. I want to switch my kilonewtons to newtons, so 3,000 newtons times 3 meters. And the moment with respect to A would be 9,000 newton meters. Okay, so let's look at our first beam problem. Um, so I have a beam that's 8 meters long, and the force is applied 2.5 meters from point A. Um, what are the reaction forces if this beam is in equilibrium? So this is a pretty common, common question. What are the reaction forces? So what we mean by the reaction forces are what are the unknown forces acting on this beam that are keeping it in equilibrium? And so if I look at this beam, I have a couple spots where I'm not quite sure what's happening. Um, I have point A and I have point B. And point A and B are both supports that are holding up this beam. And so those supports have to be doing something in order for this beam to be held in equilibrium. And so when it's asking for the reaction forces, it's asking for what are all the things that are happening on the external of the beam to keep it in equilibrium. Okay, so the reaction forces are essentially a measure of anything external that's happening on the beam that's keeping it in equilibrium. And so I have an A and a B. And what I'm going to do with my A and B is I'm going to replace the supports that are there with a couple of forces. So I have a force here and a force here. And if they're not named, then I'm going to name them 
and um, maybe a good thing to name them might just be A. Oops. A and B. Sorry. Next thing that we have to do is pick a point, a reference point. And I'm going to do this for you, and then I'll explain to you a couple strategies for doing it later. But I'm going to say we're going to take a reference point, which is going to be our point number A. So when we take measurements, we're going to take all of our measurements from point A. So when we do our measurement, um, what I want to know is now what are the distances to all the other relevant forces or points on this beam? So the question tells me that the beam is 8 meters long. And it also tells me that the force is applied at 2.5 meters from A. So that's good. Um, so I have all of my distances. Okay. At this point, we can start using our equilibrium equations. So I have two equations. And in the scalar form, what it would say is the sum of the forces up have to equal the sum of the forces down. I also have the sum of the moments in one direction. So I could either draw as a little uh, symbol or I could draw as clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, but those have to balance out. So sum of the moments in the opposite direction. So moments clockwise has to equal moments counterclockwise. So I have my two equilibrium equations. For simply supported beams, so beams that are just supported by a couple of support points, the starting point is always going to be using moments. So that's always where we're going to start. Because what happens if we looked at our forces, it really isn't going to do anything for us. If I looked at what's pushing up, I have an A plus a B, and it's going to be equal to 10,000, which is what's pushing down. So 10,000 pushing down has to be balanced by my A and B. Um, and now I have an equation with two unknowns, so there's no, no going forward from here with that just yet. So the starting point is almost always going to be moments for simply supported beams. So sum of moments going in one direction has to equal sum of moments going in the other direction. And what I have done is I've picked a point A, and I'm going to write down A as my reference point here. Okay, So I know in relation to A, what is the moment going to be, and what direction. So if I look at the 10,000 Newton force, it's going to tend to rotate about A, In the clockwise direction. So he's going to be on the clockwise side. And when I calculate a moment, a moment is going to be a force times a distance. So in this case it's going to be at that 10,000 newtons at a distance of 2.5 meters. Okay, I'm going to keep going along the length of my beam away from A until I reach any other forces. And here I have one at B. And B is going to rotate counterclockwise. So he's going to go on the right-hand side of this equation. And what I have is my force of B times a distance of 8 meters. And I want to be careful. I want to make sure I go back to my diagram and make sure I've gone all the way to the end of my beam starting at one point and going to the end, and making sure I've accounted for all of the forces and all of the rotations. Um, so at this point, I've accounted for all of my moments, and I'm going to do some calculation. So 25,000 Newton meters is going to be equal to B times 8 meters, B is going to be equal to 25,000 newton meters divided by 8 meters. 
and I'll use my calculator here. So 25,000 divided by 8 and 3125 newtons is going to be equal to B. So now that I know that B is 3,125, I can bring it up here and substitute it for B in that first equation. And what that says is that A plus B, which is worth one or 3,125 newtons, is going to be equal to 10,000 newtons. A is going to be equal to 10,000 newtons minus 3,125 newtons. And A, in this case, would be equal to 6875 newtons. Okay, and so these values here are what we would be referring to as the reaction forces. So this is what's pushing up at A and what's pushing up at B. So to erase some of the noise off the screen, what my what my draw my beam would look like is 10,000 pushing down. The B's pushing back up, 3125 newtons worth, and A is pushing back up, 6875 newtons. Okay. One last check before we leave. What we want to do is make sure that our numbers make sense. And so if we take a look at this beam, and if my load was right in the middle, what I would expect is that A and B would be balanced. Okay, so if it was balanced right in the middle. However, because the load is shifted to one side or the other, it's going to make some of those supports um, hold more or, or have a higher load. And so because that load is shifted towards A, I expect that A should be a little larger in terms of its magnitude. And so we see that uh, 6875, and that can be a good indication that we have done a good job with our calculations. Doesn't mean 100%, doesn't mean we've got it all right, but it can identify pretty quickly if we have a problem or not in our in our problem. Okay, let's look at a second problem. So this one's a little more complicated than the first one. So in this one, um, what we have is a shaft um, with two pulleys. So A and B are my pulleys. And it's secured by two bearings. So we have a diagram here, and it represents some bearings. So I have a bearing here and a bearing here and my shaft that, that runs through. Um, okay, so we have a shaft that's supported with bearings. So even though this isn't a beam per se, we can use the same kind of beam calculations to figure out what sort of load might be on any of those components. Okay, so what I want to know is how much load is each bearing seeing? Or in other words, what are the reaction forces on this shaft? Okay, so I'm going to go about the same process that I went through in the last one. So first thing is if there's any spots where I have potential loads on this object, uh, I'm going to assign some arrows to it. And let's see here. So for instance, um, I have my two bearings and they don't have forces that are shown. So I'm going to put some forces on them. And so um, maybe I just make a guess um, and geez, I got a problem. And my problem is, is that I don't know which way those forces are going. So in this case, what we're just going to do is make a guess. And when we get to the end of our calculations, uh, what we should find is that we will see if we have any values that are negative 
all it means is that our arrows are in the wrong direction. Okay, so let's assign a couple, and I think I'm just going to say, let's say all of them are going up. Okay, so if all of them are going up, then uh, that's good. And I'm going to just assign some numbers or some values to these guys. A and B are taken. Um, I guess uh, C and D might be confusing if I continue. Um, I don't know. Why don't I just call it like X and Y? Maybe that's uh, maybe that's okay. Um, so if I have my drawing here, usually a good strategy is to just draw a new, clean, fresh drawing. And there's a couple reasons for that. So one is we draw our drawing and we make sure we have all of our points on there. Um, so I have Y, I have D, which is pulling up and it's worth 300 Newtons. I have X, which is going to be pushing up and I have A, which is pushing down. Um, and A was 100 Newtons. Okay. Um, one thing is, is that we are going to pick a pivot point and a, or a reference point on this. Um, again, I'm going to give you a little instruction in a second here about what makes a good pivot point or a reference point. Um, however, I'm going to tell us right now that the best one that we would have would be right here at Y. And once I've drawn my diagram and I've chosen a pivot point, it makes a lot of sense to draw all my dimensions from Y. So I'm going to use the information given to me in the problem and I want to make dimensions from Y to all of the important points on this. So 0 0.6 meters X is uh, 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4 so 1.0 meters and then all the way across to A, uh, 1.2 meters. Okay, and that's going to help me keep track of things a little later on. So I've made some some dimensions to all the relevant points. Next is going to be my equations of equilibrium. Um, so as we recall, for a simply supported beam, uh, we're going to use our equations of mo moments first followed by our forces. Now I've left lots of room on both sides because I don't know which side they're going to be on yet and I want to make sure I've left lots of space to be able to account for multiple multiple moments if I need them. So I'm going to start at Y and I'm going to move my way across the the beam and at each moment that I get to I'm going to take a look at it and decide is it in the clockwise direction? Is it counterclockwise? And then quantify that moment and assign it to the left or right hand side of the equation. So my first one, 300, is going to tend to rotate in the clockwise direction. So it's going to come over to my left hand side of the equation. So I'll start over here. 300 newtons times a distance of 0 0.6 meters. Okay, and now I'm going to keep going. So I'm going to keep coming across the beam, and I get to X. And X is in, again, the clockwise direction. So it's going to be X, oops, not, not equal. So plus X times a distance of 1 meter. Sometimes when we use X's, we want to be careful. Um, so sometimes we might just use brackets so we don't confuse X's with multiply. Okay, and I'm going to keep going. So I get to the end of my beam and I have the 100 and it's going in the opposite direction. So he's going to be over on the right hand side, 100 Newtons times 1.2 meters. Okay, so uh, at this point, just math and rearranging and doing my algebra. So 300 times 0 0.6. Um, so 180 Newton meters 
plus x times 1.0 meters is equal to 120 newton meters. Okay. Um, so x times 1 meter is going to be equal to 120 newton meters minus 180 newton meters. x times 1 meter is equal to negative 60 newton meters. Um, x is going to be equal to negative 60 divided by 1 meter is going to be negative 60 newtons. So, um, we have a little bit of a problem. We got a little bit of a problem, but not too big of one. Okay. Um, we have a negative value. Okay. And all that that means is at the end of this calculation, when we've, when we've made sense of everything, it just means that it's going to be going in the opposite direction from what we first assumed. Okay, you have two choices at this point. The first choice is switch that to a positive and change your drawing around so that your x value is now instead of pushing up, it's pushing down. So that when you do your forces, you can account for it in the right direction. Okay, so, so, so that's choice number one. See that we have a negative value and go back and change everything to account for it. The other thing that we can do is just keep going. And when we do need to substitute x in, we're going to substitute in a negative x because that's what our drawing tells us. And then after everything is all said and done, we're going to make our changes to our system. So we can, we can decide what we want to do with those um, uh, we can take either approach. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep going. Okay, so so yes, I know that this really means that it's going to be going in the downwards direction, um, but I'm going to still leave it the way it is. So sum of moments in the oh sorry sum of forces in the up direction has to equal all of the forces in the downwards direction. And I go to my diagram for this. So I'm going to account for everything that is going up. And going up, what I have is my y. I've got the 300, and I have my x. So y plus 300 newtons plus my x is going to be everything pushing down. And in this case, it's going to be 100. I'll substitute in my x from here in place of x. So y plus 300 newtons plus negative 60 newtons is going to be equal to 100 newtons. So y plus 240 newtons is equal to 100 newtons, and y, in this case, negative 140 newtons. Okay, so it appears that I made a bad choice when I assigned my uh, loads in the first place. Uh, both of them were not going up. Turns out both of them were going to be in the downwards direction. So when I do find my answers, what I may say is that, you know, okay, so the reactions at, you know, x is going to be equal to 60 newtons in the down direction, and at y is going to be equal to 140 newtons in the, um, again, down direction. 
Um, so those are a couple of examples to just get you started with uh, your beams. Let's take a look at how we approach or how we choose our pivot point, what makes a good pivot point. Okay, so when we pick a pivot point or a reference point, uh, we always have to do that when we're calculating moments. So we always have to pick some point in the universe where we are picking our moment and or our reference point. And so that reference point could exist on the beam. It could be external to the beam. It could be anywhere. And so out of all of the entire universe, we have only a few good points. So number one, this is the most important point. Pick a point that is on the beam somewhere that is at a point where you have an unknown force that's acting. And so if that's one of your uh, reaction forces that you're trying to find, that makes for a good point. And in simply supported beams, we're usually going to have two points where we have unknown forces that are acting. So we're going to narrow down our field to picking one or the other of those. Okay. And here's why. When we pick that, essentially what we do when we're calculating a moment is always multiplying our force by our perpendicular distance. However, when we, when we calculate, uh, for instance, when we calculated our moments, um, I didn't put in A in the calculation for my moments. So I said 10,000 times 2.5 is equal to B times 8. But really, what I should have also included was plus A at 0 meters. So I didn't even bother putting that in, but maybe it should have been included in our equation. And if it did, then that ends up being 0, and so I eliminate one of my unknowns out of my equation. And that makes the math much easier moving forward. As soon as I can come to one answer for one of my unknowns, then I can use the... Um, the sum of forces in order to come up with my second answer. So really important, pick a point that is one of your unknowns because it's going to make the math much easier. Okay, so the second good practice that we could use is now that we've eliminated most points and we're down to two of them. If you're dealing with a simply supported beam and you have one of the points that's at the end of the beam, that's usually a better point to choose. And so why it's a better point to choose could be seen in our last example. So what you have is our beam, and we chose Y instead of X as our reference point. Well, what's going to happen is if we picked X and we now have forces that are creating moments in one direction, um, they're creating moments in another direction um, over here. Um, what ends up happening is it makes it a little confusing sometimes where we have up forces that are creating clockwise moments. We have up forces that might be creating counterclockwise moments. And so you often just look at the force and say, this one's going up, so it must be different than the one going down. Well, if we see in my example here, um, for instance, A and B were going in opposite directions for the force. However, their moments were in the same direction. So sometimes uh, we get confused when we just see the arrows going up or down and think that the moments must be different. However, if we start at one end, then always the moments are aligned with the 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 forces. So for instance, uh, when I did my example, I had my 300, it created a clockwise, uh, X was also up and it created clockwise, and then the 100 was down and it created a counterclockwise. So it can be easier for the accounting. So that's usually a good practice, but it's not 100% necessary, but I see lots of mistakes that are made because of not following those good rules. In the next module, what we're going to do is continue on to look at 
different types of beams, so not just simply supported beams, and how we would approach calculating them.